extreme weather, natural disasters, sleepwalking its way to catastrophe. That is how the World Economic Forum declared the current state of humanity. Since the Industrial Revolution, global wealth has increased exponentially. The cost of the success has been the exhaustion of natural resources, leading to energy crises, climate change, pollution, and the destruction of our habitat. Climate change is the single biggest challenge of our time. And so it's surprising that the situation hasn't improved, but only worsened. So how is climate change happening, and what are its impacts? Well, as you can see, the main culprit here is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas which accumulates in the greenhouse layer. Now, this traps the sun's radiation and warms the Earth. This has far-reaching effects, from rising sea levels to disrupting ecosystems. Particularly vulnerable is farming, which relies on ready access to sources of crops and livestock. Climate change flow-on effects, such as floods, droughts, ocean acidification, and acid rain, can have disastrous effects on agriculture. And so for the, from the perspective of farmers, climate change isn't just bad for the planet, it's bad for business. So where can we target? As our largest export, farming has been the economic backbone of New Zealand for over a century, and constitutes a significant aspect of our national identity. However, over this time, agriculture has been the largest emitter of greenhouse gases, contributing almost 50%. With food demand expected to, in, uh, expected to grow anywhere between 59 and 98% by 2050, it's clear that changes must be made in how we maintain our land. But there is one aspect of modern farming that I'd like to highlight in particular, and that's the use of synthetic fertilizer. Fertilizer comes from a time where there was no knowledge of the long-term effects on soil quality. For farmers, fertilizer was a miracle. Harvests doubled, and they were able to supply food to a growing population. However, over time, the effects have become apparent. Research shows that the widespread use of synthetic fertilizer leads to soils that no longer have the required biology for healthy plant growth. This reliance on chemical fertilizer also alters the carbon cycle by removing two key actors in the soil food web. The impact of this is that CO2 is no longer stored in the ground, but released back into the atmosphere. When you consider agriculture accounts for 40% of all land use, uh, it's clear that human interference of the carbon cycle has large ramifications. So what is the key to restoring, uh, sorry, what is the key to restoring the carbon cycle and reducing CO2 emissions? Further investment in agritech? More taxes on farmers? Well, I present to you a resource so plentiful and basic to life, it's recognized as its own phylogenic kingdom. I'm talking about fungi, and, and specifically mycorrhizal fungi. So mycorrhizal fungi usually exist entirely underground, growing symbiotically with the roots of plants and grass. Sym symbiosis refers to an intimate relationship which is often mutually beneficial, such as the one you share with your local pub. For more than 500 million years, the majority of land plants have shared their carbohydrates with mycorrhizal fungi that colonize their root systems. In exchange, the fungi provides nutrients such as phosphorus and uh, nitrogen. However, by decreasing the pH level, chemical fertilizer raises the acidity in the soil, removing bacteria and fungi which can't tolerate it. But why do we care about having fungi in our soil? Well, mycorrhizal fungi offers many benefits for farmers. The exchange of nutrients increases absorption area by as much as 50 times and increases overall root biomass. This is because its hyphae, essentially fungi's arms and legs, uh, act as an extension of the roots further into the soil, similar to a prosthetic leg. These hyphae are also very thin, and so they can access parts of the soil where the thick roots of the plant can't penetrate. What we will focus on, however, is the ability of mycorrhizal fungi to sequester carbon. So how does carbon, oh, so how does carbon sequestra sequestration actually take place? Well, CO2 and sunlight are photosynthesized by the plants into sugars. The plant then exchanges the sugars for water and other min minerals with the fungi. 
the fungi and bacterial microbes then turn the carbon atoms into what is known as humic acid. This is a liquid form that flows down the hyphae deeper into the soil where it is sequestered. But what is happening currently without the necessary mycorrhizal fungi in our soil? As dead plant matter is broken down by decomposing microbes, the carbon is released back in the air where it accumulates. Oh, sorry. When we reintroduce fungi in our soil, we can negate this release of carbon back into the atmosphere. This is because microbes re require nitrogen to decompose the plant matter. And fungi produce enzymes which also extract nitrogen from the soil. Therefore, what essentially happens is a boxing match between the microbes and the fungi for the existing nitrogen in the soil. Fungi jabs the microbe by extracting faster and slowing down the decomposition process. The haymaker is when it exchanges the accumulated nitrogen for sugars from the plant. And the metaphorical championship belt, the amount of sequestered carbon. But how effective would this really be? Well, soil is the largest terrestrial reservoir of carbon. By increasing the capacity of this carbon sink, we can heavily reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Rodale Institute estimated soil can sequester 7,000 pounds of carbon per acre per year. And how much of this is the work of fungi? Well, during a recent study, scientists discovered that 70% of all sequestered carbon was being fed through the trees as sugars and eaten by the mycorrhizal fungi. In short, it does a lot. Current scientific research points to introducing fungi through seeds. However, I believe this would likely be neither cost or time efficient, reducing the likelihood of wide-scale adoption. Instead, I propose Glomus aranicum, or GI. In powdered form, GI can be dissolved in water and applied through irrigation systems, which is the same as current fertilizer. This means that farmers will not need to invest the time to learn a new soil treatment method or use a skill set they're not comfortable with. GI has three other benefits. It is high lean, highly saline tolerant and so improves resistance to adverse weather. This is because of the alkaline nature of GI, which has a pH of 9.5. And so it can be implemented in soils where the soil has been damaged by fertilizers um, without being killed off. It also promotes soil stability by binding tiny particles into coarser fragments. It does this by the release of glomalin, which, acts, which is a protein which acts as a sort of superglue. This is important as we're currently losing 24 billion tons of soil per year. And so by, restoring, uh, by increasing soil, uh, reducing soil erosion, we stop shrinking our carbon sink. Lastly, GI sequesters greater amounts of carbon than regular mycorrhizal fungi. This is because of two reasons. GI produce more nitrogen degrading enzymes and so they can extract a lot faster than other mycorrhizal fungi and a lot faster than the decomposer microbes. Mycorrhizal fungi also typically dominate deeper soils with the decomposer microbes um, existing in the shallower soils. And so with its elongated hyphae, GI can reach further in the soil and extract minerals that other mycorrhizal fungi can't. But how long can the carbon be stored? Well, most research points to carbon staying in the soil for about 500 years. However, it is expected that GI stores it for longer. This is because of its unique relationship with melanin. melanin uh, sorry, the melanin produced by GI is a more stable form of carbon and which does not break down as easily as linear carbon compounds. When integrated into soil, the effect is twofold. It increases carbon sequestration and increases the longevity of that sequestration. So now onto sustainability. So the resilience of fungi also allows farmers to, uh, sorry, allows farmers to take on more risk in their investments because they don't have to be worried about adverse weather reducing yields. Further, kiwi farming will establish itself as a global leader in ethical practice, which would hopefully increase export demand. Lastly, farmers will ensure themselves against many of the proposed taxes as well as making themselves eligible for carbon credit. Onto social, we can expect to see greater cohesion amongst rural and urban areas. Farmer th farmers in their communities have been denigrated by uh, the urban media in recent times, with plenty of media allocating the blame of climate change onto them. By changing to more environmentally sustainable production, we can help alleviate this. Environmentally, 
we can expect to see a decrease in the amount of CO2 accumulating in the greenhouse layer, reducing the effect of climate change. We would also expect to see healthier rivers in New Zealand, because the decreased use of fertilizer will then reduce leachate. Lastly, the increase in the number of fungi lower in the food web, food, food web should cause a cascading effect up the food web. The flow-on effect of this is the potential to see greater numbers of keystone species and native birds such as tuia, tui, resulting in an overall healthier ecosystem. If these practices were widely applied, they could store the equivalent of taking nearly 42 million passenger cars off the road. So in conclusion, it aids in the decomposition of organic matter, facilitates nutrient cycles and the storage of carbon, helps to build soil, uh, soil structure and protects the plant. Fungi has the potential to be our carbon warrior and by tipping the bacterial fungal ratio in fungi's favor, we can tip the climate in our favor. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Did we, do we have this fungi in our soil right now? Yes, so we have a buscular mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, we have many different species. Um, and this have we got GI? Not GI. So um, I, my sort of plan, as you see, is introducing GI as an alternative to native AMF. So AMF is mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and so it's been applied a lot in Europe and North America. Um, however, New Zealand hasn't, uh, it's not native to New Zealand, and so we, we haven't introduced it here. So, you want to introduce a whole new species to the New Zealand ecosystem? Yes. So, um, how fungi works in the soil is that um, it doesn't spread very easily often because it has very unique, um, uh, sorry, very unique um, requirements for which plant it bonds with. And so, um, using GI, we wouldn't have the risk of it sort of going into our um, native ecosystems. That so which plants does it bond with? So it, plant, it bonds with most, um, with, uh, it's expected to bond with mo bo most um, grassland and plants in New Zealand. So the, not that unique then? Yeah, so it's, I think the, it would sort of spread to all grasslands, but it wouldn't extend to a lot of environments that we don't want it in. I don't think it creates any harm for grasslands and plants in New Zealand. Um, other than replacing existing um, mycorrhizal fungi. But what we've seen anyway is that we've actually removed a lot of the mycorrhizal fungi from New Zealand through the use of fertilizer because it's too acidic. But Glomus iranicum doesn't mind acidic. Sorry? GI. Yeah, so it's alkalinic nature, so it has a pH of 9.5, and that means it can um, survive in acidic soil. There's a, there's a particular variety of it, the Tenui High Farum which apparently has a patent on it because of the quality you've been talking about. Is that the variant that you're talking about? Yep, yep. So the patent's held by Symborg. Um, so yep. we would have to buy the patent? Yep, but the beauty of um, Glomus ranicum is that you can actually create it yourself. So farmers could um, create the fertilizer themselves. Um, it's sort of a longer process, but I guess the cost of implementing this as opposed to the cost of um, implementing fertilizer when we sort of discount future cash flows is actually is a lot cheaper. So I think what So what's the patent on if farmers can make it themselves? I think it's on the distribution of it. So I don't think I think you can produce it yourself. And how would you be able to produce it yourself? Uh, yeah, so I don't actually have the method itself. Um, but it was talking about um, oh, I, I, I sorry I can't remember. Okay, thank you. Thank you.